1968. It is the bloodiest year of the Vietnam War. American tanks are caught up in the thick of the fighting. There's a common misconception that tanks, you know, were not used very much in Vietnam. The tank commander said, bring it to the left, bring it to the left. Start shooting. To win the war, the Americans unleashed the military might of their armored forces. Our two tanks put out savage firepower. But the North Vietnamese fight back, sending their own tanks into battle. Next thing I remember seeing was a round coming toward us. Now, North and South fight to decide the fate of Vietnam. Tank versus tank. In the final phase of the war, the North Vietnamese armor really did prove decisive. the city of Hue in central Vietnam. With its historic citadel and temples, Hue has long been revered by the Vietnamese people as the old imperial capital and a center of their culture. But today, many buildings lie in ruin. Riddled with shell and bullet holes, scarred by the fighting during what the Vietnamese people call the American War. Nineteen sixty-eight. War is raging in Vietnam as forces from north and south battle for control of the country. Since 1954, Vietnam has been divided into north and south along the 17th parallel. The North is led by Ho Chi Minh, who is fighting to unify all of Vietnam. The partition of the country into two parts, which the leaders in the North, primarily Ho Chi Minh, simply refused to accept. It was always their goal to reunite Vietnam as a single country. More than just a national conflict, the fighting in Vietnam is also a front line in the global Cold War between America and Russia. The American interest in the Vietnam War was directly related to the Cold War. It was to prevent Soviet influence in Asia. They thought if South Vietnam fell, next to fall would be Indonesia and the Philippines, and all of Asia would become communist. By 1965, American leaders believe the only way to stop Ho Chi Minh's fighters is by committing US ground forces to Vietnam. On March 8, a small expeditionary force of 3,500 Marines and two platoons of tanks lands at Da Nang. The Americans are caught up in wave after wave of guerrilla attacks by the communists. Ambushes. Rocket-propelled grenades. and landmines inflict heavy casualties on the Americans. The American tanks weren't ready for the Vietnam War in 1965. But the broader point has to be made, the American military establishment wasn't ready. In an effort to crush the enemy, the US increases its troop levels to half a million, while its armored force grows to hundreds of tanks. From 1965 to 1968, the American numbers and tanks increased in South Vietnam because they believed the communists were going to launch more conventional operations. Northern commanders are indeed preparing a large offensive. In 1968, they will attack all across South Vietnam during the Lunar New Year holiday known as Tet. And the Americans will now have the opportunity they want to destroy the enemy with their overwhelming firepower. They believed if they could bring the communists to a, a conventional battle, they could defeat them. 
January 1968. A fateful year in the Vietnam War begins. In Hue City, the streets are crowded with Vietnamese celebrating the New Year. And amongst them are thousands of communist fighters who have infiltrated the city disguised as civilians. January 31st. Explosions rock the city. The Tet Offensive begins. 75,000 communists attack villages and cities across South Vietnam. And nowhere is the fighting more fierce than the city of Hue. American and South Vietnamese defenders are overwhelmed as guerrilla fighters appear out of nowhere. Within a day, the communists control much of Hue. The city Hue had particular symbolic importance to the South Vietnamese as it was the ancient capital of the country. American and South Vietnamese reinforcements rush to the scene, including M48 tanks from the Marine Corps' 3rd Tank Battalion. We'd always trained that we're going to be in the jungle and we're going to be in the scrub and in this third world country, and all of a sudden we're in a city. And I got there, and some of the buildings were burned up, and, and, and there were fires going on in the city, and they actually were fighting street by street and, and house by house. And they call us and say, OK, saddle up. And we jump in the tanks and take off. The M48 Patton is ideal for tank-on-tank -tank combat with a 90 millimeter gun and 110 millimeters of frontal armor. But on city streets, it is vulnerable to anti-tank weapons fired at close range. Urban combat is, is always nasty because you're fighting at extremely close ranges. It's like fighting in a three-dimensional maze. We got to a corner of a street. I'm looking through this tiny little periscope. All of a sudden, kind of in the distance, I see a couple figures running. The tank commander said, where? Bring it to the left. Bring it to the left. He said, bring it further to the left and start shooting. And nine times out of 10, you didn't even know what you're shooting at, you just shoot. We'd have this five minutes of crazy action, and then we pull back. But in Hue, there is no front line to pull back from. The fighting is everywhere. We park the tanks and wait for the next call to action. And I didn't want to get out of the tank the first time because the North Vietnamese were all around. Tanks, in particular, are vulnerable because any place that you have open windows, open doorways, rubble of buildings, the tank can be attacked from ground level. The tank can be attacked from above. Two tanks were next to each other, two tank crewmen who had been out they were all sitting around. The North Vietnamese mortar came in right in between the two tanks and, and took two or three of the guys out. Of the 14 or 15 crewmen that went up there that first day, almost every one of them had been medevaced out and had been replaced by somebody else. came in a country in a combat zone like Vietnam, they give you a little time to kind of acclimate and you get some orientation as to what to expect, but there was no time for that with Tet. We found out that we were going to be going into way. And we walked in, and that's where we first found the vehicle. That's the tank that I wound up on. We were basically replacing the crew that got hit. And uh, I found myself as a replacement gunner. It was in pretty horrible shape. It was to be expected, you know, the tank commander had basically had his face taken off. So there was blood around the tank commander's cupola, and you could see it inside the turret. The interior of the tank might be covered with blood, body parts, things like this, but they just stuck you in that tank and you kept going. So I thought, oh my god, what am I, what's going to happen now? All I remember is the platoon commander telling us what to expect. You know, this was not tank country, he says, we're going to be going down streets. 
In an urban environment, tanks suffer the disadvantage that they're constrained to the roads and areas they can move through. So the communists could more easily lay ambushes in areas where they believed the tanks would go. Guys might be hanging out the window, trying to drop a satchel charge on top. If somebody's firing at you with heavy weapons out in front, you're basically stuck in the street and all you can do is back up. But the tank goes a lot slower than the stuff he's firing at you. Days after the armored reinforcements arrive, the Americans still cannot dislodge the communists from Hue. The United States was concerned about public opinion in the Battle of Hue, in that having the Vietnamese communists seize the city for a period of time was embarrassing. As the fighting drags on, U.S. commanders worry that images of tanks destroying the historic city will anger the American public. The rules of engagement in Hue were more restrictive because it was an urban area. And one of the odd things about this war came home to me as fact. I had heard about it, but I thought it was just the veterans kind of putting on the new guys. They were telling me that sometimes they found themselves in a firefight and had to request permission to fire back. I said, no, that doesn't happen. I was going down a street, and I just happened to be looking through a gunner scope at a, at a window in a building, and I saw this flash. And a branch from a tree just flew off, like something had hit it. I'm looking at this building. Driver saw the weapon, but I, I didn't know what he had. The RPGs were the North Vietnamese primary anti-tank weapons. They were essentially a reusable grenade launcher, but it was absolutely deadly to cruise. I tell the tank commander, let me put a round in there. He says, no, wait. For what? He has to call in and request permission to fire. Had visions of uh, 900 rocket propelled grenades all pumping holes into the tank and turn it into a disable. Time kind of slowed down. The tank commander got his permission, and before he had the word fire out of his mouth, and put a hole in the building. The communists are finally driven from Hue. But much of the city lies in ruins. American casualties are high, and confidence in a swift victory in Vietnam is shaken. The American public opinion was the great casualty of the Tet Offensive. Prior to the Tet Offensive, American politicians said, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are about to defeat the Vietnamese communists. The fact that the Vietnamese communists could launch a major offensive across South Vietnam suggested that the light was nowhere near the end of the tunnel. 40,000 South Vietnamese civilians are casualties of the Tet Offensive, and over 45,000 communist fighters are dead or wounded. Yet Ho Chi Minh's forces still fight on other battlegrounds where they hope to turn the tide of war. The remote mountains of central Vietnam, a rusting American tank recalls fierce battles that raged here in 1968, a reminder that the North Vietnamese were entering a new phase of the war with a new weapon, their own tanks. The NVA had tanks as early as 1959. However, they were in a school. They didn't employ their tanks in battle until 1968. At that point, the NVA were equipped with the PT-76. It was a Soviet-made tank, an amphibious tank. It was useful to infiltrate South Vietnam so they could move them from North Vietnam through the number of water courses they would have had to cross. And now the NVA will use their tanks to spearhead a major attack to seize the large American combat base at Khe San. 
They will infiltrate from North Vietnam through Laos and across the border along Highway 9 and attack Khe Sam. It was believed that the overrun of Khe Sam would be a prelude to a much larger operation to take parts of the northern provinces of South Vietnam. Had they been able to take the northern provinces, it would represent a discernible victory. Highway 9, South Vietnam, January 1968. The NVA begin their advance along the highway. NVA infantry and tanks will attack their main objective, Khe San. First, they must take a small U.S. Special Forces base, which guards the route, just 10 kilometers away at Long Ve. The North Vietnamese mass nearly 2,000 troops and 16 tanks to attack Long Ve. Defending the base are just 24 American Special Forces soldiers, supported by 450 local mercenaries. Well, we got a call from the captain at Long Bay that said, uh, OK, Long Greer, go ahead and bring your troops on in. We're going to disperse you around the perimeter so that we can defend this camp. He said the other night that there was uh, some tanks over in Laos. He said he thought there was about three or four of them. And I said, OK, why are you telling us? The tanks had never been used in the South Vietnamese war before. And what was going over in Laos was their business. So when we moved in, we established our position, started digging bunkers and everything. The North Vietnamese artillery in the mountains begins firing on Long Ve Special Forces base. They could look right down on top of us. So they were, they were putting some pretty effective fire on us every night. February 6th, 1968. Night falls over Lang Ve. And so at this point, we feel like this may be it. The communists are about to unleash their attack. Leading the assault will be PT-76s from the NVA's 198th Tank Battalion. The PT-76 is a Soviet-designed light tank with a crew of three. It's armed with a 76.2 millimeter main gun, but it has only 17 millimeters of frontal armor. When the North used tanks at Langve for the first time, it represented the beginning of a shift in their strategy. They were prepared to blend conventional operations with guerrilla operations. As the PT-76s reach the perimeter wire of the base, the sudden appearance of so many NVA tanks catches the Americans by surprise. Sergeant in the bunker with me, he said, sir, I only got one thing to tell you. We got tanks in the wire. I said, are you serious? Tanks in the wire? Let's go, man. All of a sudden, I'm like, whoa. God, look at that. That's, that's, a, that's a Russian tank, man. It's a PT-76. The Americans scramble from their bunkers and ready their main anti-tank weapon, the 106-millimeter recoilless rifle. And then, boom, the 106 goes off. They knocked out the first tank, opened the breach, put in the second round, knocked out the second tank, put in a round, knocked out the third tank. But the Americans are soon out of ammunition for the 106s, just as the NVA sends more tanks into the attack. The Americans fire mortars to try and stop the second wave of tanks. But the NVA press on. A PT-76 tank bears down on Longrier. And so I, I drop down below the wall, you know, I had a light anti-tank weapon. And I open it up, pull the safety out. The M72 light anti-tank weapon, or LAW, fires a 66-millimeter high-explosive anti-tank round, 
that should penetrate the armor of a PT-76. Click it and I throw it down. Give me another. The law is proving unreliable, and the PT-76 tank is closing. So I tried three of these things, and they wouldn't fire. So the third one, I lined up the sight right at the very front where I thought the driver would be on the tank. And I go, <laughs> and I can watch the round. It's going down through like that, and hits right where I'm boom, and goes straight up in the air. I'm like, it's not supposed to do that. The rocket bounces harmlessly off the PT-76. Now the tank crew turn their attention to the American bunker. And then the tank stops. Clank, clank, clank. He goes. Starts moving his big barrel toward us, you know. And I thought, yeah, it's time to get out of this bunker. The North Vietnamese have adopted the American tactic of using the overwhelming firepower of the tank. Lang Vey's defenders are on the verge of defeat. After a few hours of combat, the North Vietnamese control most of the Lang Vey base. Long Greer and the remaining special forces fall back to their last defendable position, the Tactical Operations Center, or TOC. Which is this uh, underground bunker where all the radios and the command uh, signals go out and everything. The NVA lose no time in pressing home their attack on the defenders in the Tactical Operations Center. And sure enough, we hear a tank. And here he comes. Boom, 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 boom. But the Americans have learned a lesson about the PT-76. And I said, I think we can kill him from the side. I said, don't shoot him in the front. It don't work. We fire that law on that tank. Boom. So we knocked that one out. And here comes one behind it. And so I fired. But it doesn't kill it. They can't go anywhere. It knocked the track off. So now they're swinging the gun around. So I still have a law on my shoulder. Then I went ahead and fired it. Another PT-76 is destroyed. The relentless NVA tank attack closes in on Long Greer and the defenders. Another tank comes out. And here we go with the old. So I knew what was fixing to happen. Desperately short of anti tank weapons, Long Greer heads into the talk to look for more. So I took off downstairs. Just as I get to the bottom, boom! And the concussion knocked me through the, the entrance. So that was pretty much uh, the beginning of the end for us. The NVA tanks have overrun Lang Vey. Trapped in the talk bunker, the Americans refused to surrender. I mean, they were hanging through the hole, throwing hand grenades and shooting us, and all of a sudden. This tank pulls up on top of this bunker. We can, we can see the dirt falling off the seats going. Mm, mm, mm. Driving a several ton steel beast and pivoting it over and over again above the bunker was likely, in their minds, to have caused a surrender.
But Langvey's defenders hold out in the bunker. In an act of desperation, they call for an airstrike on the NVA, who are on top of their own position. Such decisions are never taken lightly. They're going to engage in something that might sacrifice their own lives for a greater good. The dangerous tactic pays off as the aerial strikes force NVA tanks and infantry to pull back and allow the American-led troops to escape. On February 7th, the North Vietnamese finally take Lang Ve. They lose seven tanks in the attack, but prove their armor can be decisive against the Americans. With Lang Ve eliminated, the NVA now focus their attack on the large American base at nearby Khe San. In Khe San, the survivors from Lang Ve, including Long Greer, are arriving. Of the 24 American special forces, 21 are casualties. But they find they have traded one version of hell for another. Khe San is under an intense artillery barrage with shells landing every 10 seconds. In early 1968, Quezon was surrounded. It had been isolated by North Vietnamese forces immediately prior to the Tet Offensive and subjected to a prolonged bombardment. North Vietnamese besiege Khe San, trapping some 6,600 Marines and South Vietnamese troops, and a detachment of M48 tanks. I volunteered for a tank assignment and volunteered to go to Khe San. The siege of Khe San to me personally was, I hope, the closest I'll, I'll, I'll ever get to hell. Advancing on the American base is a battalion from the NVA's 325C Division, numbering some 600 troops. They prepare to assault the outpost on Hill 64, near the west end of Khe San Combat Base, and a position known as the Rock Quarry. Uh, the Rock Quarry was a knoll where there were two tanks, one in front of and one in back of each other, uh, kind of hidden from the enemy. February 8th, 1968. In the early hours of the morning, NVA soldiers close on the American perimeter. We would come out very voraciously at night uh, looking for enemy with our Xeon scope. They dug trenches and tunnels leading up to our lines until they were 50 to 100 meters from our trenches and our lines. NVA soldiers crawl silently forward to place explosives under the barbed wire. They could melt through our lines like a hot knife through butter. Of course, we didn't know what was coming. And now, NVA commanders give the signal to attack. And I distinctly heard the, the bugle, and I knew what it meant. And saw the flares. It is the signal to detonate dynamite and blast holes in the perimeter wire. NVA machine guns and mortars begin firing into the base. We were hit with a uh, barrage of artillery, mortars. NVA infantry storm up the hill towards the American position. It was Alpha 19's outpost. It was on Hill 64. 
and they were being overrun. The Marines pull out of their bunkers and withdraw. The NVA reached the top of Hill 64, intent on destroying the American positions. But there was just a couple things that were in the way of it, and that was two tanks. In places like Quezon, tanks couldn't hold ground, but they could certainly try to prevent someone else from taking it. The American tanks maneuver behind the enemy attackers, but are forced to fire on their own positions, now held by the NVA. So we've got to put some heat in there, and that's what the tank commander, and that's what the gunner were screaming and yelling and calling for. We fired a dozen, dozen and a half rounds. And we put many of those right into the same bunkers that our troops were in only uh, minutes before. Our tanks put out savage firepower. The counterattack forces the NVA to withdraw, but not before they demolish the American bunkers. In the battle for Hill 64, the North Vietnamese lose 150 dead. Tanks played a critical role in the siege of Quezon. We displayed to the enemy that we could be at any point that they would choose and that we could be there in a matter of moments. The NVA lose thousands of men attacking Khe Sanh. The siege is finally lifted in April. But soon after, the Americans withdraw altogether from the base that they had fought so hard to keep. Nineteen sixty-eight is the deadliest year of the war for the United States with over 15,000 Americans killed in combat. The death toll fuels the anti-war movement, with protests erupting throughout the US and around the world. 1968 does represent a turning point for the American will to fight. What the American public discovered was that they were going to have to pay a much greater cost to save South Vietnam from the communists. And it's at that point that the American public began to turn in much larger numbers than it had before. While the United States grows weary of the war, the North Vietnamese remain determined to continue fighting and defeat their enemies. New offensives are planned, and tanks will be crucial as the communist campaign to unite the country expands. Ho Chi Minh's guerrilla fighters are now a modern army, ready to take on the most powerful nation on Earth. 1969. To replenish their forces in South Vietnam, the NVA moved troops, supplies, and tanks to the south via the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a series of routes running thousands of kilometers through the jungles. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was a nickname of the communist route for communications, logistics, and infiltration into South Vietnam. To disrupt the enemy's supply chain, the Americans have a line of fire bases along the Ho Chi Minh Trail from which to attack the communists. One of the most isolated is Ben Het Special Forces Camp. Located in South Vietnam's Central Highlands, near where the Ho Chi Minh Trail runs through neighboring Laos and Cambodia. Ben Het was an important objective. Because of its location, had they been able to take Ben Het, it would have opened the door to operations that might cut the country in two. The base occupies three hills, with the west hill nearest the trail. 
is protected by the tanks of B Company from the U.S. Army's 1st Battalion, 69th Armored Regiment. In early 1969, NVA commanders decide to assault Ben Het. Spearheading the attack on the base are up to 10 PT-76 tanks. The NVA believed that tanks would play a decisive role at Ben Het. March 3rd, 1969. Three M48 tanks are dug in on the West Hill, protecting Ben Het Firebase. We had them dug in. They were in trenches, you know. All that was sticking out was a gun tube and what have you. As night falls over the base, all is quiet. Until the Americans hear engine noises coming from across the nearby border. Special Forces unit had a team out with one of their lieutenants, and they reported that there was tanks moving down around the area between us and the borders. And we got our night vision, scopes out and devices, and started looking. We saw the PT-76s out there. The first tank-on-tank -tank battle of the Vietnam War is about to begin. To be honest, we're surprised overall that it was coming our way. Ben Head does represent a tank-on-tank -tank action by accident. I have difficulty believing the North Vietnamese would employ a PT-76 against an M48. Two PT-76s are quickly knocked out. But the third closes on the American tanks and opens fire. The next thing I remember seeing was a round coming toward us. The closer it got to us, the bigger that round looked. It looked to me like he was going over. But it didn't. It hit the uh, loader's hatch. And when it did, it blew the uh, tank commander out of the cupola. It blew me off the back deck. He and I wound up 15, 20 foot behind the tank. He cut the lower two crewmen who were to my left half in two, each one of them. Half of them on the back deck, the lower half on the ground. The PT-76 shell has killed and wounded the crew of the M48, putting it out of action. The remaining US tanks pummel the NVA attackers. Finally, the communists withdraw. At the first break of dawn the next morning, is when they saw at least two tanks had been destroyed. Though the North Vietnamese will launch more infantry and artillery attacks in the months that follow, they fail to capture Ben Het. But the tank-on-tank -tank battle fought here marks a deadly escalation in the conflict. The use of tanks by the NVA represents an increase in the NVA's confidence and ability to wage conventional war. By July 1969, more than 40,000 Americans have died in Vietnam. And there is still no end of the war in sight. On September 2nd, North Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh dies. But his dream of a united, independent Vietnam lives on. You can kill 10 of our men for everyone we kill of yours. But even at those odds, you will lose and we will win. The Americans start peace talks with the North Vietnamese and announce they will begin pulling out their troops.
we have adopted a plan which we have worked out in cooperation with the South Vietnamese for the complete withdrawal of all U.S. combat ground forces. The American tankers had been among the first to arrive in South Vietnam. When the U.S. believed they could win a swift victory with their overwhelming firepower, now they are amongst the first to head home. As North Vietnam moves from guerrilla to conventional warfare, their tankers prepare to play a greater role in their fight to unite the country. And as the American war is ending, the fighting in Vietnam enters its decisive phase. 1972. Most American forces have withdrawn from Vietnam, leaving the South alone to defend itself. Because of the American withdrawal, the South Vietnamese economy was weaker. They didn't have as much money to spend on their own defense. The North, however, strengthens its forces with help from the Soviet Union and Communist China, who supply them with powerful new tanks. Soviet aid allowed them to rebuild their forces for future operations. The North Vietnamese did believe that they could defeat the South in a conventional war in 1972. Spring 1972, the communists launch a new offensive. The attack will be their largest of the war, and it will be spearheaded by hundreds of tanks. When people think of Vietnam and tanks, most people make the assumptions jungle. But there were areas that were very, very good for the employment of tanks, particularly the northern provinces. The main tank assault falls on the border provinces, where the communists believe the enemy is weakest. This was the first time the North Vietnamese used tanks en masse during the war in Vietnam. For the attack, the North Vietnamese field 30,000 troops and more than 150 tanks. Defending the northern provinces are nearly 30,000 South Vietnamese troops and dozens of M48 tanks. March 30th, 1972. The attack begins as NVA troops swarm across the border into South Vietnam. With them come two regiments of armor, which includes the most modern tank they have, the T-54. The T-54 is a Soviet-designed main battle tank. Intended for tank-on-tank -tank warfare, it's armed with a 100-millimeter main gun and has nearly 10 centimeters of frontal armor. The NVA plan to use their tanks to capture the provincial capitals of Quang Tri and Hue, giving them control of the northern provinces. In order to do so, they must cross a vital bridge over the Kua Viet River at the town of Dong Ha. The Dong Ha Bridge was important because it could handle armor traffic. Had it fallen into communist hands, they would have been able to continue further south and get to Saigon. As the NVA tanks close in on Dong Ha, the South Vietnamese Army rushes its newly formed 20th Tank Battalion to defend the bridge. They have 42 M48 tanks and are ordered to hold Dong Ha at all costs. The South Vietnamese tanks take up position on high ground overlooking the bridge. They wait for the NVA tanks to come into range. As the NVA tanks approach the bridge, they enter a killing zone. The South Vietnamese open fire with deadly accuracy. Eleven enemy tanks are hit. But a 
T-54 reaches the bridge and starts across. A lone South Vietnamese Marine aims to stop it with an anti-tank weapon. If the bridge is captured intact, the NVA can advance to Quang Tri City. His first shot misses. He has one rocket left. His second shot jams the enemy's turret. The disabled T-54 pulls back. The defenders blow the bridge. Stopping the NVA tanks from crossing. The communist offensive continues for another seven months by which time the North loses hundreds of tanks. But they gain control of some 10% of South Vietnam. The Vietnamese communists believe the end was in sight. In early 1975, the NVA mounts yet another offensive. Their tanks begin to attack southern positions and advance towards the capital, Saigon. April 30th, 1975. As the last Americans flee, tanks of the NVA's 203rd Armored Regiment roll into Saigon. One of the iconic images of the war is one of those tanks pushing down the gates of the presidential palace in Saigon. The Vietnam War is finally over. The entire country is now ruled by the communists. In the final climactic phase of the war, the North Vietnamese armor really did prove decisive. Over five million Vietnamese people die in the battles that raged in the war for Vietnam. The war cemeteries and memorials bear witness to the terrible price they paid to be unified and independent. <laughs>